Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. A few weeks ago, I asked which movie you'd want to see covered next, and you guys voted for Sinister, which happens to be one of my favorite horror films of all time. In the movie, we follow a true crime writer who investigates the killing of a family and the disappearance of their youngest daughter. In order to write the book effectively, he moves into the house where the murders happened, but things get increasingly weird when he finds a box of snuff films that contain the answers he's been looking for. So let's review what happens in the movie and how to survive. It. The movie opens with a family of four with bags on their heads and nooses around their necks. An unseen figure then uses a saw to cut a branch which causes them to be hanged. After that, we cut to Allison Oswald, a true crime writer as he's moving into a house with his wife Tracy and their kids Trevor and Ashley. As Allison carries a box into the kitchen, we see the same tree from the Super 8 tape in the beginning. Allison moved into this house as the previous family's murder is the case he will cover in his new book. He also hopes to find out what happened to the youngest daughter, Stephanie, who mysteriously disappeared and wasn't found with the rest of the Stevenson family. Allison's books always try to determine what really happened in the unsolved cases, so this one seemed like a perfect fit. As they're carrying boxes into the house, the local sheriff stops by to tell Allison that he's not a big fan of his work, as his previous books spread a bad theory that let a killer go free. However, the officer did like Allison's first book called Kentucky Blood, but everything after that was pretty lackluster. Allison seems to be aware of this and sees this new case as his final chance of making a comeback. As he's exploring the house, he decides to take a look into the attic. There he finds a mysterious black box. When he walks up to it, a scorpion appears. Allison quickly drops one of the moving boxes to crush it. That scorpion should already be the first sign that something is not quite right. Scorpions don't usually show up in residential houses in Pennsylvania. Most of them live in the desert, some of them in trees or under rocks, but the one we see here is most likely a forest scorpion, whose habitat is Southeast Asia, or an emperor scorpion that comes from West Africa, and neither of them have a similar climate to what we see here. Of course, Ellison shouldn't immediately move out because of a wild animal, but the only reasonable explanation for the scorpion is that somebody planted it there. And when things get increasingly weird later on, it can be seen as another piece of evidence that something is seriously off about this place. Allison opens the box out of curiosity and surprisingly finds an old projector with some Super 8 tapes. All of the roles have innocent names like Pool Party or Barbecue, making them look like boring home movies, but what Allison finds in them will be much worse. That evening at the dinner table, the kids ask why they moved and when they can go back to the old house and Allison tells them that if he can write a great book, they can go back very soon. After everyone goes to bed, he starts working on the deceased family's case. Thinking that the ominous tapes can help him solve the mystery of the missing girl, he loads up the first one, titled Family Hanging Out 2011. The video starts off innocent enough with the Stevenson family playing in their backyard. The guys are throwing a football around while Stephanie plays on a swing. All of this is accompanied by some creepy music. With a sudden cut, we see the tape from the beginning where the family is being hanged, but it's only for the five family members. After finishing it, Ellison reviews the footage and asks some important questions, like who made the movie and where is Stephanie and why isn't she being killed with the others? Since it's the first tape, there isn't much information given to us that we can take advantage of, but something already seems off. After the family's death, the police presumably looked through the entire house for clues, and with the house being for sale, there must have been multiple people who went through the place. Yet Ellison is the first person to stumble upon these tapes, meaning that after the murder, somebody came back and left the videos there to be found. And it's not unreasonable to believe that the person who left the tapes is the same guy that filmed or killed them. It's not like the films are an MP4 that everyone can download, but it's a Super 8 tape, this isn't exactly something people would make tons of copies of, even back in 2011. I mean, the device to play the films was included because it's so outdated. So if there's a reasonable probability that the killer came back to the house after the murders, Ellison should immediately call the police to bring his family to safety. But instead, he decides to watch another tape. This one called Barbecue, 1979. We see a family fishing by a lake, and not even a minute in, and we get another hard cut to a car with its door locked sitting in a garage. As the camera goes around the car, we see the family tied up inside with multiple canisters of flammable fluids. When it goes to the front, we see some sort of symbol on the hood, after which the car is lit on fire. It erupts in a big flame with everyone inside being burned alive. Ellison, who gets increasingly nervous, simply watches in shock. He calls the police to tell them about the tapes, but when he looks at his breakout bestseller on the shelf, he hangs up and decides to do this all by himself to write a better book. He goes back to his corkboard and mutters, 
You came back and left the box. Why? But the intention is quite obvious. Whoever killed these two families is the same person or at least the same group. The obscure editing and use of outdated technology indicate this. So if someone came back and left the box, it can easily be a threat to whoever finds it. We also see something more important, and it's that the killer stalked his victims before he killed them. He's lurking in the bushes and filming them from far away before the families are murdered. Meaning that if Ellison experiences anything that indicates that he's being watched or followed in his own home, it would pretty much be a dead giveaway that he's the killer's next target. When he gets ready for the next tape, he hears some noises inside the house. He goes to his daughter, but she's already sleeping, so it can't be her. He goes closer to the noise and sees one of the moving boxes shaking. Suddenly, his son Trevor crawls outside of the box and screams. <coughs> Ellison runs towards him to help. Trevor is having a night terror, which is similar to sleepwalking combined with a bad nightmare you can't escape. He brings him outside to calm him down. Eventually, his son snaps out of it and goes back to normal. Ellison and his wife are a little surprised as he hasn't had these in a long time. And the fact that Trevor is experiencing these night terrors again may be another indication that something's off. It might seem far-fetched, however, Ellison later goes on to remark that they're far worse than ever before. That paired with the supernatural things happening in the tapes, like the tree branch being sawed off by someone invisible and that the films were left for him, seems like enough evidence to get some help. At this point, Ellison's book would make a good unsolved case, and he'd be credited with finding the horrific tapes, which already seems better than the last few books he wrote. But Ellison wants to keep going. The next day, he watches the third tape, which I found the scariest. It's titled Pool Party 1966 and features a family in their backyard being filmed by the same stalker. When we get to the murders, the different family members are tied to pool chairs and are drowned. Then as the cameraman pans to the other side, we see someone standing in the water. Now this tape, even though I think it's the creepiest one, is probably the only one that you could survive. In the previous films, the victims were burned and hanged, which can't be prevented. But drowning victims can be brought back even after swallowing water. But that's only if the right steps of resuscitation are quickly followed. However, the strange being and the cameraman don't seem too eager to help anyone. After re-watching the tape and inspecting the pale figure's face, the film starts burning. Following this, Ellison makes digital copies of them. Once nighttime comes around, he watches the second to last tape, labeled Sleepy Time 1998. We see someone walking around the house. We then go upstairs and see all the family members tied to their beds. After they get killed, Ellison scrubs through the tape to see all the small details. He again sees a symbol on the wall. It looks exactly like the one drawn on the car in the barbecue tape. He also sees the name of the city where it took place. Ellison researches the murders and finds an old news clip describing the events. As he watches this, he hears creaking noises coming from the attic. A few seconds later, the lights shut off, followed by more stepping sounds. Ellison decides to walk through the house to investigate. Once he climbs up in the attic, he finds the cover of the box. On the inside of it are childlike drawings depicting the murders. In the drawings, we see a mysterious figure called Mr. Boogie. This is presumably the one responsible for the murders and kidnappings. He starts recording them with his phone and tries to go back downstairs. Once he gets close to the stairs, he breaks through the ceiling and falls to the floor beneath. The next morning, one of the deputies comes over to the house. During their conversation, he reveals that he's a big fan of Ellison's work. The officer asks if he needs any help with the case. Ellison requests him to dig up the files of the murders we've seen, but he only gives vague details but reveals nothing about the box with the projector and says that the cases are completely unrelated. Once he's alone again, he reviews the footage a few more times and finds the creepy white figure in all of the movies spectating the kills. Ellison then already gets a call from the deputy who tells him the address where one of the murders happened. Ellison appears quite stunned, but when the deputy asks him if it's anything significant, he says no, but he's clearly lying. Two nines. Wait, did you say 2976, like 2976? Yeah, why, does that mean something to you? Uh, no, no, it doesn't. No, thank you. Thank you, deputy. It's then revealed that at least two of the murdered families had some sort of relation. The Miller family, the victims of the Sleepy Time tape, lived in 2976 Piedmont Way where the Stevenson family, the victim of the hanging, lived before they moved to the house Ellison is in. He then reviews his recordings in the attic. On it, he sees himself falling through the boards, but after going back a few frames, little hands are seen pushing him down through the floor. This is the first evidence we get that there is something supernatural happening. 
it's probably the most blatant moment where Ellison should notice that whatever he's taking on here is clearly too big and far too dangerous for him. Usually in horror films, the family doesn't know that a ghost is in the house, so they don't run away. But in this movie, Ellison knows something weird is happening, but chooses to stay because of his obsession to write another crime book. Even though it makes for a great story, it should be the clearest indication that he should get the authorities involved. And here is what calling the police can do for him. Once they see that they are dealing with a killer who continuously stalks their victims, Ellison should be under some surveillance. Also, later on we find out that you can estimate when the killer strikes. So if they know when the attack happens, Ellison should only be under heightened surveillance for a short time. When the family gets attacked, the police could interrupt the killing. We'll get into more detail further in the video, because there is more information that is shown later on. But that is the general reason why calling the police and getting proper help can save his family. The next night, Ellison is down to the final tape, labeled Lawn Work 1986, and this one is quite intense. We see a family being watched through a window in their house. The person with the camera almost comes right up to the window filming the family. Then on a rainy night, we see someone getting a lawnmower. It gets pushed down a small path and eventually on the grass. Suddenly we see one of the family members lying on the grass as the running lawnmower goes over their face. After that, Ellison decides to take a break. He goes on a video call with a professor hoping he can help him decipher the meaning of the symbols we've seen. The man tells him that the drawings in the tapes are used to worship a deity named Bagul, or the Eater of Children. Bagul resides in a different world and needs the souls of children to survive. To get the kids, he manipulates the youngest child as they are usually more susceptible to his methods. He then tricks them into coming into his world. Ellison then shares what he has so far with the professor. One key piece of information we get during this conversation is that the worship of Bagul requires a blood sacrifice. This indicates that the family's killing is a key step for Bagul. It seems to be the final piece of the ritual that allows him to capture the kids and take them into his realm. That means that if the family's killing is successfully interrupted, Bagul can't take the kids and with enough time he would starve. After experiencing more strange things, Ellison calls over the police officer he met. During their conversation, he's behaving quite strange and is asking the deputy bizarre questions. The man asks if he is alright, but doesn't believe when Ellison insinuates that something weird is going on. The officer mentions how Ellison surrounds himself with dark murder cases and always sees another open whiskey bottle in his office. This, the officer thinks, leads him to see things that aren't really there. Since Ellison has a legitimate reason to be scared for himself and his family and needs at least a little bit of help and protection, he should have shared some of the evidence with the deputy just to prove that he isn't crazy and that there is a reason for concern. He could tell him how he found a box of evidence from the Stevenson's case in the attic, meaning that the murderer or someone close to him had come back to the house. And since the killer appears to be a stalker who follows his victims before killing them, it's a reasonable possibility that Ellison is in danger. He already heard someone walking around his house, which means that time is running out for him. Since the deputy has shown to be a fan of his work and is very loyal to him, Ellison can probably trust him not to share any of the important details of the case. With the help of the deputy, Ellison would get the protection he needs from Bagul, and he would only share a little of the evidence that would make his book unique. Anyways, that night, Ellison once again walks up to the attic. There he gets scared by all the missing kids from the cases. They sit there watching a tape of Bagul. This is also the first time Ellison sees the being face to face. This is when he decides that it's too much and goes to burn the tapes in the yard. When his wife asks what's going on, he tells her to get the kids. There will be no book about this case and he simply wants to get out of town. They drive off and move into their old house. As the furniture is being brought back, Ellison gets a call from the deputy but doesn't answer it. When it's getting late, he goes into the attic of his new house and sees the same black box of foam movies. There's also an envelope containing the extended cuts of the films. He decides to add the footage of the videos and watch the full version. At this point, Ellison has undeniable proof that he's being followed. This is his last but also probably his best chance to call the police. And it's kind of strange that he doesn't. Before this, he didn't get any help because he wanted to profit off the murder tapes by having exclusive access to them. But now, sharing them with the police wouldn't be a problem since he's no longer writing his book about it. Before he manages to watch the tapes, he gets another call from the deputy and decides to pick up. They discuss the cases and he shows Ellison that each of the murders happened after the family moved into the house of the previous victims. Somebody would move into where Bagul killed a family. After they move out and go into the next home, that's when Bagul would kill them. 
By moving back into their old house, Ellison has put himself into the timeline of the murders. Since he lived in the Stevenson's house and left, his family will now be killed. He then watches the extended cut tapes. In them we see how the youngest kids are always the ones killing their families. This is how Bagul gets the kids. He is released by the tapes. The pictures and videos of himself act as a gateway into our world. Once he's there, he manipulates the youngest kids to kill their family. This is part of the ritual for their abduction. When they successfully murder everyone, Bugul takes the kids into his realm to feed on their souls over time. As he realizes this, he starts to get a strong headache and looks into his coffee. There he sees a glowing green liquid. It's shown that his daughter brought him the coffee. When Ellison sees this, he passes out. A few minutes later, his daughter is standing over him with an axe and the Super 8 camera, while everyone else is tied up with tape. She tells him not to worry, and that she'll make him famous again. She then kills the family, after which she gets taken by Bugul. So one way to survive Bugul's actions is to simply never leave the first house. However, he would continuously torment you until you'd have to flee. The other way to beat him is move out, but stay under surveillance. Since we know that Bugul attacks shortly after you move, it would only be for a few days. Then once he strikes, the ritual of killing the family can be quickly interrupted, since it's the kids killing the family, not the demon. This is further explored in the sequel. There we see that if the child fails to kill their family, the parents and siblings can survive. Unfortunately, the youngest kid would be killed by Bagul, but the rest of the family lives. There is a big loss, but either one of them dies or none of them live. And after the kid would be gone, the rest of the family would be free of torment. Bagul only comes after them to get the kids. If there's no kid, there's nothing for him to do as the grown-ups are not susceptible to his methods of manipulation, so they would be left alone. By the way, the fact that Bugul kills the kid in the sequel even though he didn't kill his family doesn't really make a lot of sense. The entire reason the tapes exist is to complete this elaborate scheme necessary for Bugul to kidnap the youngest one, but then in the sequel he can just kill them anyway. If you only go by the rules of the first movie, the child would not need to die and they should all live if the ritual is successfully interrupted. Let me know what you guys think. As always, thank you so much for watching and I hope that I get to see you in the next one. Bye guys.